Um, all right. Well, praise the Lord. Take your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 1. Last week I gave you an introduction, talked a little bit about the letter and how Paul was addressing it, and uh, we spent, uh, well, boy, almost 45, 50 minutes, because we didn't have any worship last Wednesday night. Uh, we sang one song, a cappello, and, uh, and then here we went, and we had a good time. I don't know about you, but I went home, I had a great time last Wednesday night, and I'm looking forward to a great time tonight, and so if you got your Bibles, look with me. Uh, tonight we're going to pick up in verse 12, Paul is now explaining one of the questions and one of the problems that was coming up at the church at Corinth, if you remember the first chapter or the first book of Corinthians in and first Corinthians, Paul dealt with issues in the church at Corinth. There were problems that the church was going through. After the church had been established and Paul had left and had set up leadership in the church, there were a group of people that came in calling themselves apostles and prophets and leaders, and they began to tear down everything Paul had established. They began to discredit Paul's apostleship, his authority, and, and uh, then they caused other problems in the church. Well, Paul... Uh, wrote that first letter back to them and addressing the issues and trying to help them to correct the things in the church so that things would be put back into order. And then now, in the second letter, he's gotten a, a report back that these people are saying that Paul's apostleship is no good, that he is not worthy to be trusted. And so he's addressing some of these issues in his first chapter. So look with me, verse 12. Now this is our boast. How many of you know what it means to boast? There ain't none of you that do that, is there? Not about yourself, for sure. How many of you know what the Bible says in, in Proverbs? Pride cometh before the... Uh, when people start tooting their own horn, I start having problems hearing. <laughs> you know, I like to see the fruit on the tree. How many of you know? I, I just soon you don't you don't have to tell me all you did. Now there are times I like to listen to people's story and how God's blessed them and used them, and but but I found out that it's nice to be able to see God's working in some, and 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 then I come up and say, you know, I really appreciate Tina because Tina every Wednesday night she's faithful. She goes and picks up kids on that van and she takes them home. While you're going home and getting ready for bed, she's still running kids around town trying to get them in her place. That, that's my privilege to boast. It's your privilege to boast about her. She doesn't have to go around boasting. Well, you know, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. It, when people start telling me, I'm, 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 so there's a problem. You know what? You do your job and God will reward you. God will honor you. People will begin to see it and they'll begin to recognize it. But Paul says, this is my reason to boast. This is my, this is my chance. He says, now this is our boast. He says, our conscience testifies that we've conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relationships with you in holiness and sincerity that are from God. For we have done so not according to worldly wisdom, but according to God's grace. Paul, we talked a little bit about this in the first 11 verses last time, but Paul gave him uh, illustrations of, you know, when we came to you, we came because we were concerned about you as a person. You were lost in your sin. You were going to hell. But we spent everything that we had so that we could reach you. We gave of ourselves, and, and, and Paul's bragging a little bit about what he's done, but he knows that he's only done it through the help and the grace of God. He talks about how he was over in, in the area of, of uh, uh, oh boy, Derby and Lystra, and, and how he was taken and stoned and left for dead and raised up again, and he didn't quit. I'm not talking about somebody saying bad names about you, okay? I'm talking about they actually took stones and threw them and pelted him, knocked him to the ground, and he got up and he kept on pressing on. 
You know, he was later put in the, in the Philippian jail there in Philippi, and, and he was praising God about midnight, and all of a sudden the chains fell off, and the earthquake shook, and the gates opened up. He said, we did this because we were willing to suffer, because we did it for you. We wanted to reach your soul. We wanted to touch your life. We want you to meet Jesus. We want you to have eternity in heaven. How many of you want eternity in heaven? Amen. I want to spend the rest of my, you know, not life here, but eternity with God. That's why we're doing this thing on Sunday nights. Those who have been here, you know what I'm talking about. We're doing a, a series called Driven, Driven by Eternity. We're, we do what we do. We act like we act. We behave like we behave because we know that there is something beyond this life. Life is not over when we die. That's only the first death. Those who are in Christ Jesus don't have to worry about a second death. All they have to worry about is, what will I be doing when I get into eternity? And the way you live today will determine how you will live in eternity. The more you serve him, the better your life is. The more you please him, the more you do for his kingdom and reaching souls. You are storing up riches in heaven. Are you with me tonight? And Paul knew that, and he's talking about this. He said, this is my boast. You know how we behaved when we were with you. Do you remember when Paul went to Corinth the first time in Acts chapter 18 when he shared the gospel with them? Paul went in there, and he did not charge them. He didn't take up offerings to take care of himself and his own needs. He said, I was a tent maker. I sat down with the others, and I worked every day just like anybody else to earn my own income so that I could provide for myself and not be a burden on you so that I was not selling the gospel. You know, he was doing a work because he wanted to touch their lives. He says, we did it with sincerity, and we lived. I didn't live a double standard life in front of you. That's what Paul's saying. I didn't live this way in church and this way outside the church. How many of you know there are people that do that? There are people that come to church, and they act like they're somebody good. And then the rest of the week, you hear them out there, and they act like they're just part of the world. They're doing everything that they shouldn't be doing as a Christian. And Paul said, that's not the way we lived. You see, Paul is appealing here to their firsthand knowledge. He said, you know what we were like when we were there, how we conducted ourselves when we were there when we first came to Corinth. You see, Paul had stayed with them for a year and a half, 18 months he had been there. And, and you can see that in Acts chapter 18 and verse 11. And so as we look at verse 13 here in, in our, our text tonight in chapter 1, he says, for we do not write you anything you cannot read or understand. And I hope that as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, we lived a life that you can be pleased with. I hope my prayer is as pastor of this church that I will always have a good reputation. I pray that my life will be so that it would never be tarnished and that there would ever, never be a, a story told. Well, we had this pastor. He was there for so long, and he did so good. But at the end, he blew it. Lord, I don't want that. To ever, I pray every day, Lord, keep me from falling. How many of you know we're all susceptible to falling? If you think you, you can't fall, you have fooled yourself. Because every one of us here tonight can, can mess up that quick. Lord, forgive us. If, you know, I pray that we don't. Help us, God. To, you know, I think about Jude. I love the, the, the gospel of Jude there. As I, as I read his one little uh, you know, chapter in the book of Jude, one of the things he says, he can keep us from falling. How many of you know it's him that keeps you from falling? It's not yourself. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit kind of wakes you up when you start thinking the wrong way and he starts slapping you around. <laughs> Come on. What are you thinking? Don't you realize that if you do what you're thinking, you will have messed up everything you've ever stood for? It could happen that quick. 
And you've got to pray continually, God, help me to live and be the man of God you want me to be. So Paul's saying in the last part of 14, he says, you can boast about us because we've lived before you. We've been there. And he says, just as we're going to boast about you because there were some good people in the church at Corinth, just as there are good people in this church right here, there are people that are faithful to God who have been committed to him that are living godly lives and doing their work. Let me tell you, Paul says, I'm going to be able to brag about you one day and what God did in your life and what God has done for you. And that's what he's talking about in that passage. In verse 15, he says, because I was confident of this, I plan, because I know what you're living like, I plan to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. Some of you say, what do you talk about, pastor? Visit you first and, and, and so I can visit you twice. How many of you know Paul his, in chapter 18 of Acts was his first trip into the area of Greece and Corinth. And that was when he established the church. That's, he was there for 18 months. That was his first visit. That's when the church started. He left there and he went back. This was during his second missionary journey. Paul would have been out. And so Paul is, is uh, dealing with, with the church of Corinth. He's done great things. He's coming back on his third missionary journey. He goes from the interior, going up uh, through uh, Philippi, not Philippi, but through uh, Lystra and Derby and those winding up in Ephesus. He's in Ephesus when he gets the letter from the church at Corinth about the problems dealing with the first Corinthians. Something you're going to find out as we read a little farther in a minute, Paul receives another letter dealing with all this, and he sends the first letter, and as he gets more information back, he realizes things in, in Corinth apparently are so bad that he takes a journey across the sea there into Corinth for a, a second journey over there to deal with some of the issues. Now, there are some who recorded there's possibility that there is a lost letter of Paul's Okay, that there may have been another letter written to the Corinthian church, but Paul dealt with the Corinthians personally before he wrote 2 Corinthians. He went and made another visit, even though it doesn't appear that way and because of the way the writings are. But you'll see it when he talks about it a little bit later here. Now, some of the issues they were dealing with was some ungodly people that had got into the church and were destroying the church. And he tried to deal with it, as you would say, texting, <laughs> over the phone, however you would call it today, email. But those weren't available. He tried to send a letter, but sometimes the letter's not stern enough. And so Paul went over there hating to do this, but he said, Andrea... You are, call no, I'm just <laughs> you are causing such a problem. Why are you people listening to these false teachers? They have nothing to do with the religion that I brought you in Christ. They're teaching you. He had to go deal with some of these people that had started following the false doctrines and addressing them. It was a very hard, difficult time for him. You know, pastors have a hard time sometimes trying to minister to their people because when we see people going astray, we see them making poor choices in their life. We try to make suggestions. We try to encourage them. But if we're not careful, we're the bad guy. And they think that what we got to say don't mean anything. And so they get agitated with us. They leave the church. They'll, they'll quit going to church. They'll get upset. And Paul had to go and address some folks until finally it became very troublesome for him. You'll see this as we go through this text. So Paul's talking in this verse. Here's we talk about verse 15. He had planned to go back to Corinth, in Corinth first, and he was going to travel. He's going to take a little visit, stay a few days or a week, whatever, and then travel up into Macedonia, do what ministry he needed to do there, come back down one more time and visit the Corinthian church the second time, when he said twice on that same visit. 
And from there, he would travel back to Jerusalem. Remember, Paul was on a journey for, for a couple of reasons. One, he was preaching the gospel, winning souls. He was doing great work. In Ephesus, revival had broke out. But along the way, Paul had asked the different churches that he established, please start taking up a collection so that we can take care of the people that are in Jerusalem that are having a difficult time because of the famine that's there. Paul did not want the money for himself. However, some of these false teachers had come in and false apostles had said, oh, he just wants the money for himself. He just wants to take that money and put it in his own pocket so he could spend it. And Paul said, no, that's not the case. I want you to send some dignitaries from your churches to come with me so that you can be assured that that money is put in to the treasure in Jerusalem and it's given to their account. I'm not getting anything out of it. Remember, Paul... His ministry was not to go and receive, but he was to go and give. That's, that's the type of, he was an apostle who did that. So when we look at this verse, we see that he had planned to be there twice. In verse 16, I plan to visit you on my way to Macedonia and then come back from Macedonia and then have you send me on my way into Judea. When he talks about sending him on his way, he was not talking about sending me with monetary personal gifts, but with a gift for the church of Jerusalem. And there was one more thing that he wanted them to send him with. Can you imagine what he might need? What does every missionary need more than anything? Thank you. Missionaries need our prayers. They are traveling on a journey of unknown. They're out there trying to spread the gospel. And when we're doing the work of the kingdom, I want you to know that the enemy is not happy. And when we step into his territory to take back from him what he has stolen from God, the devil doesn't like it. How many of you know our missionaries need our prayers? They are constantly under spiritual attack. They are constantly under depression. They go through all kinds of, of, of feelings and emotions, not only in the, in the emotional state, but also in the physical state where Satan is struggling and trying to come against them. Paul is telling, I want your prayers. I I want you to pray that God will sustain me and keep me and help me to do the work that I've got to do. So verse 17 says, so when I planned this, did I do it lightly? I mean, I just didn't do it off the cuff. My desire was to come to you and spend time with you twice. I wanted to bless you twice. I wanted to be there twice. So my plan, he says, I didn't plan it in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I said, yes, yes, and no, no. Yes, yes, and no, no. Anybody know? Yes, yes. Isn't that right, Liz? Well, you can do that. Yes? Yeah? That's no? Well, we learned it this way. But that's all right. But It doesn't matter, but there's yes and no. Okay, whatever. Yes, yes, and no, no. Think about it. What are we talking about? Yes, yes, and no, no. You see, the term yes and no at the same time refer to somebody who's kind of fickled. You ask them, hey, would you like to go out to dinner tonight? Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. Would you like to go to, no, yeah. They're fickle, they're double-minded. They can't make up their mind what they want. Paul said, I didn't do this lightly. It wasn't a yes and a no. It was, I was planning to come to you and spend time with you. It was my desire to do that. He wasn't fickle about it, you know. Uh, people that are fickle are hard to trust. How many of you know? And that's what the false apostles and false teachers were trying to say. Paul's a fickle individual. How could you trust him and what he teaches? How could you trust him because he's yes, yes, and no, no? You see, the way they said that was because Paul had changed his itinerary. Instead of going to Corinth first, Paul changed his itinerary and didn't do it that way. And he got word of that along the way. Well, verse 18 says, but as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. How many of you know Jesus is not yes and no? But he is yes. 
Come on. Verse 19 says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. Jesus saves. Can I hear an amen? Jesus loves you. Yes, he does. It isn't a, well, he might love you today. How many of you know Jesus loves you all the time? Jesus loves you so much that he gave his life for you. He gave his life's blood for you. He gave up everything for you. It was yes, and in him it's always yes. Amen. How many of you know what that word amen means? So be it. Let it be sealed, signed. It's it. That's finished. Verse 20 says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. How many of you believe what this word says tonight? If God said it, do you believe it? That's all it takes. God's not fickled. The word's not fickled. Whatever he promised, it will happen. Now, how many of you know there are conditions to some of his promises? Let me say that again. There are conditions to his promises. Don't expect that you can live like the devil and claim every promise for yours. Come on. If you go back to Deuteronomy, I believe it's in, in uh, I think it's 28. If you go back and read the blessings. He says, if you will do this, I will bless you this, and I will bless you that, and I will bless your coming in and your going out, bless your wombs, I'll bless your fruit, your children, I'll bless your cattle, your sheep, your houses, your barns, your flocks, your, you know, if you do. But in the second part of that chapter, he says, but if you fail, you will be cursed in this and cursed in that. And how many of you know there are, there are obligations that we have? Amen. Well, let me read verse 20 one more time. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are always yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen, the so be it, is spoken by us to the glory of God. Verse 21, now it is God. Who is it? It is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. For he anoints us, sets his seal of ownership on us and puts his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. I want to take just a few minutes over this next couple of minutes here. There are four things I want to share with you. Paul outlines here in verses 21 and 22. Number one, after people are into, brought into a right relationship with Christ by renewing them spiritually, the Holy Spirit comes in and helps them to gain a firm spiritual foundation, which allows them to grow in their faith. You know, if all we do is we say a little prayer on Sunday morning at the altar, Father, forgive me my sins. Cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. You know, I confess you as Lord. If that's, the, if that's all you prayed is a sinner's prayer and you've done nothing else, you know, you've done the introduction, but you've never developed the relationship that God desires with you. And what happens is as you begin to grow in Christ, he begins to establish you in a right relationship which renews you spiritually. We've got to renew our minds. I feel a message coming on real quick about renewing our minds. How many of you know it's important to renew our minds? And we do that through the Word. The Holy Spirit then helps us to gain a firm spiritual foundation. You know, when Paul, when Paul had his transformation on the road to Damascus, when he got into Damascus and his scales fell off his eyes in Acts chapter 9, all of a sudden, he was transformed from who he was to whom God wanted him to be. But Paul didn't go right out immediately and start preaching. But Paul spent time in preparation, and the Holy Spirit taught him and developed him 
and raised him up into the man of God that he needed to be. He had to have a firm foundation. One of the things, if you were here Sunday night, if you listened to the video as John Bevere was talking about how people want to, to do this and that for God, but if they don't ever get rooted and grounded into a, a local church and stay planted every time a storm comes along, every time somebody gets upset and you uproot and move to another church, you'll never have deep roots. You'll never be able to stand. You know, somebody come to me, it might have been Danny, I don't know who said... He said, Pastor, I might not have much on the top, but my roots go deep. <laughs> you know, because when storms come, the roots is what holds you into the ground so that you can stand firm. And it's because we are able to be strong in Christ. The Holy Spirit helps us. He guides us. He leads us. So first thing Paul tries to tell us here, now God who makes us both uh, both of us stand firm in Christ. He anoints us here. He brings us to this place and makes us strong with a foundation. We need that. The second thing we see is the Holy Spirit anoints us. He sets us apart. He commissions us. He empowers us. Uh, believe, he empowers the believers and gives them power to communicate Christ's message. How many of you know Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to go fishing? Well, yeah. Fishing for men. It didn't say the Holy Spirit comes upon you and he will make you now good people to go on a picnic. He will make you lazy the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and you shall skip church every other Sunday. Not what he says. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. He says you're going to have power to tell people about what God has done in your life and how he's transformed you. How many of you know it's not that important that you know the Roman road. Yes, it's good to know the Roman road, but what people really want to hear, what did God do in your life? How did he change your situation? Where were you headed? You know, if we ask around tonight, some would say, well, Pastor, I was caught up in pornography whenever God came into my life. And he delivered me from that lifestyle. My head was so messed up. Some might say, well, pastor, I was an alcoholic. I would always turn to a bottle looking for help. Others might say, I was on prescription pain medicine. But Jesus stepped in on the scene and he delivered me. Come on. That's what people want to hear. What did Jesus do for you? How did he make a difference in your, make it real. Come on. And that's where the power of the Holy Spirit comes on. The Holy Spirit all of a sudden gives you the anointing to start sharing what God has done in your life. It's not that you can go around quoting, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Romans says that we should, you know, all are condemned to die, but God demonstrated love towards us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us, you know, Romans 5, 8. He says, Romans 3, 23, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. You can start going around quoting all those things, but... It's important that they learn them at some point in that transition, but the first thing they need to hear out of you is, what is God doing for you? And let me just say this tonight to those of you that are here, most of you dear old saints, but let me just say, if you don't have a testimony, you might need to go back down to the altar. Where did God bring you from? What did God do in your life? You know, I've told you my testimony before. My testimony is not that God brought me out of alcohol. My testimony is not that God brought me out of drugs. My testimony is simply this. 
God kept me from a life of alcohol. God kept me from a life of drugs. God kept me from a life of por uh, pornographic material. God kept me from a life that's sinful and lustful. And God has kept me from all those things. Let me tell you what, that's a testimony tonight that I didn't get caught up in the world and it didn't overcome me because God kept me from that. And a lot of the reason is because my parents, come on, my parents saw that I was in the house of the Lord every time the doors were open. And I've mentioned this before, but some of you, maybe you haven't heard it, but I remember my mom was not here tonight. Maybe she won't cry because she can't hear it. Every time I tell the story, I watch her. <laughs> I remember one night I was, I was being rebellious. I was a teenager. And I probably wasn't about 13, 14 years old. I said, come on, it's Sunday night. Let's go to church. I don't want to go to church. I want to stay home and watch the wonderful world of Disney. I'd heard about it. Never seen it. So I went to church every Sunday night. Always come on Sunday night during church time. Mama said, we're going to church. I said, I don't want to go to church. I'm going to stay home. You're going to church. I don't want to go to church. All right, if you're staying home, I want you to take this book right here, the Bible. And I want you to read this chapter. And when I get home tonight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to question you on that chapter, and you're going to answer the questions. I went and put my clothes on we went to church. I figured it was easier to sit there and listen than it was to have to sit there and study to prepare for a test. And I never did it again. They were firm. And they made sure that we were where we needed to be. But today I can tell you, because of their firmness and their love for me, I didn't have to go through a lot of problems that a lot of people have had to go through. God kept me while I was a young man. Did I ever try anything? Not much, but I did. But not, much. not enough that it ever enticed me. I was afraid that Jesus was going to come back and I was going to get left behind. I wouldn't hear mess up. I, I just, I, I've had my heart on, on heaven forever. I, ever since I can remember, I don't want to miss the kingdom of God. I don't want to miss the eternity. I'm not going to fool around. You know, some people, they like to take that gun and they call it Russian roulette and they'll spin that revolver around and they'll pull the trigger. Not me, bud. I don't have that good a luck. Because I know just as sure as the world, the moment I run off and do something I knew I wasn't supposed to, the trumpet of God was going to sound, and I'd be left behind. Folks, that's what kept me living for God. You say, well, that's fear. No, it's respect. It's a holy fear in the sense of I respect him enough to know that he may come at any moment. And I don't want to miss the first boatload. Some of you may believe in post-trib. That's fine. You stay right there. You, just, you stay here as long as you want to. Some of you believe in mid-trib. If you don't know what I'm talking about, talk about the book of Revelation. Some people believe you're going to be here all the way through the tribulation. Some people believe halfway through the tribulation. That's mid-trib. And some of us are pre-tribbers. We're getting out of here before the tribulation. Are you with me? Man, when that trumpet sounds, I'm gone. If I ain't, I, at least I didn't miss anything. Come on. I, 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 I won't, I'm ready to go. I'm I'm, on, I'm Maybe I should say it better. My dad would say when he was having his last few days, when he was around, I'd always say, Daddy, are you ready? He said, no, I'm just, I'm prepared. <laughs> How many of you know there's a difference of being ready and prepared? He wanted to stay here. He wanted to continue to enjoy life. But if the Lord called him, he was ready. And that's the way we need to be all the time is ready. Should the trumpet sound, is your heart ready today? Are you ready? Lord, I went to preaching. I'm messing up here. Number third point, the Holy Spirit not only anoints, but the Holy Spirit is the official seal of God's ownership. You ever, you ever uh, seen, I don't see this too often anymore, but used to uh, meat that you would buy in, in the meat store. 
you know, in the butcher or Winn Dix or whatever, you would see that purple ink on the meat that would say USDA approved. How many of you remember that? Anybody seen that lately? They must not approve it anymore. I don't know. I hadn't seen it in forever. But that was a seal. That was a stamp. It said this has been inspected and it's approved. I want you to know that God puts his seal on us. He stamps us. He puts his anointing on us. Can you say amen? So when he does that, he puts his official seal of ownership, marking the believers as his very own property. And it produces godly character within their lives. Church, when the Holy Spirit's in your life, you've got to live a godly life. Come on, are you hearing me tonight? You don't have time to fool around with the world. You don't have time to mess around with alcohol. And People say, well, isn't it all right for, for Christians to drink? Why do you even want to ask that question? Why do you even want to think about doing what the world does? Is it sinful? I don't know. Well, Jesus did it. Yeah, but that's what they had to drink back then. But I know too many people that can't control themselves, and it's better to abstain than to get involved and fall off the wagon. Hello, are you hearing me? Why do you want to look like the world? Why do you want to behave like the world? Why do you? The world's not our home. He said, I've called you to be a peculiar people. Come on. A holy nation. People are going to look at you and say, why do you do that? Because I love Jesus. Why do you act like that? Why won't you do what we do? Because I love God, and that, that offends him. It may cause a weaker brother to fall or stumble. I don't want to do that. Lord forbid, I don't want to have some kind of a millstone tied on my ankle and thrown into the water and drowned for causing a young brother to stumble and fall. Hmm. I'm sorry, I'm just getting excited and preaching tonight. I'm having a good time again. The fourth thing, the Holy Spirit not only is God's seal, but the Holy Spirit is a good deposit. It's a deposit. It's the first installment and the guarantee of the believer's eternal life. When the Holy Spirit comes, man, that's, you got it made. When you got the Holy Spirit and you're living with him, as long as you keep him in there and deposits there, how many of you know when you got money in the bank, you're okay? If you clear out your banking account and you go back and say, well, hey, I'd like to take a little more money out, they say, I'm sorry, but you've overdrawn. There's a lot of people in the, in the Christian world that have overdrawn on the Holy Spirit here. A lot of people in the, in, the, in the church today that have overdrawn. <clears throat> they went to meddling now. The Holy Spirit is a deposit. It's the first installment, the guarantee of a believer's eternal life and inheritance with Christ. So, verse 23, back to our text, says, I call God as my witness that it was in order, talking about why he changed his itineration, it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth right now. He changed his plans so that he could spend more time with them Later on, than just make two short visits. He knew that, that the winter would be coming on, and so Paul said, I will rather come where I can spend more time and help to get you guys back on track. If it's just a pass-through visit, like our missionaries come by and we see them for uh, uh, one Sunday or we see you know, special guests come in and going, Paul said, I don't want to do that. I want to come and make sure that y'all are on track doing what you need to be doing so I will spend my winter with you, and when it's time to start sailing again, then I will get on a boat and I'll head on back to Jerusalem. Verse 24, now that we, not that we lord over your faith, but we work with you for your joy because it is by faith you stand firm. How many of you know you stand firm because of your faith? If it wasn't for your faith, every time a storm comes along in your life, you'd be blown away. Every time some upheaval comes in your life, if you didn't have a rock to hold on to, how many of you know who that rock is? Jesus is the rock. He's the foundation. 
And we hold on to him when we're going through trials and tribulations. We hold on to him knowing that he will keep us and we will be steadfast. We have a firm foundation. Let me just read these last couple verses to you. You say, well, that's all there was. No, you need to hear the last first four in chapter 2. So I made up my mind, verse 1, that I would not make another painful visit to you. Paul had been there to deal with correction. He said, I'm not ready to do that. You guys just keep on working. When I get there... I'm not going to have to deal with this because you're all written. Holy Spirit's already going to deal with you. I believe that's what he was saying. See, Paul had already made it a quick visit with them to deal with some of the problems between this writing of First and Second Corinthians. And, and there was a lot of people that were really struggling. And, and, you know, you say, well, how do you know he went there? Well, if you look at chapter 12 in Second Corinthians in verse 14, he says this, I'm ready to visit you for a third time. This is where we come up knowing that Paul had already been there to start the church in Acts 18, but because of the first letter he got, apparently he went to deal with them and set some things in order and get things corrected. So in chapter 12, verse 14, I'm ready to visit you for a third time, and I will not be burdened to you because I want, uh, what I want is not your possessions, but I want you. And in the next chapter, in chapter 13, he says, This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of three verses, or three, pers- three witnesses, rather, two or three witnesses. And I already gave you a warning when I was with you on that second visit. So we see that he had already made that. And here's the last three verses you need to hear tonight. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad? but you whom I have grieved. Paul said, I don't want to come and have to beat on you if I grieved you, you know, because you're not behaving like you should. I've already had to do that. I've already had a bad visit. I don't want another. I'm going to go around to Macedonia. By the time I get there, y'all get yourself in order so I don't have to do all this again. How many of you know the Holy Spirit sometimes needs a little time to work on us? I found out that the Holy Spirit can do more than I can in a matter of just a few seconds. I could spend an eternity trying to deal with somebody. A lot of times the way I deal with people, I don't always address them face to face because I know they're not going to accept what I got to say. I get in here on my knees and I start praying, God, begin to reveal to them what they need to do. Now, if God directs me and leads me, I will address somebody. I will talk to them, and they will not be happy with me most of the time. But I pray that by the time I get to them, that they will have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Because if they don't make a correction in their course, they're going to be shipwrecked. They're going to be on the rocks. They're going to find themselves. You see, it's a struggle for pastors. Paul was struggling with this. Verse 3 says, I wrote you as I did so that when I came to you, I should not be distressed by those of you who ought to make me rejoice. You ought to make me happy, but you don't because you're living the way you are. You bunch of rascals, you, is what he's trying. I'm just trying to bring it into today's language. He says, I had confidence in all of you that you would all share in my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. And that's the pastor's love. I love you. Will you just please listen? Change the way you're living. Make a correction before it's too late. Because Jesus is coming soon. Let me say it again. Jesus is coming soon. Stand with me. Stand all over the church. Holy Spirit, I pray tonight that what you have spoken to our hearts will become alive and will come real to us. God, I pray that if there's anybody here tonight that's not sure about where they are with you and their salvation, that God, they would call upon you tonight and ask for forgiveness of sin. And that, Lord, you would assure them of their salvation. God, if they're walking without the help of the Holy Spirit, God, I pray that they would receive your precious Holy Spirit in their life tonight. 
and you would empower them to be the man and woman of God that you've called them to be. With your heads bowed for just another moment. If you're here and you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure about my salvation and I want to make sure that I'm living right with God before I leave here tonight, just slip your hand up and say, pray for me. Pray for me. I'll wait just one more minute. Pray for me. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's here. God, I pray your blessings. Help us. Keep us from falling, Lord. And go with us as we go our ways tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Come expecting Sunday morning. Come. Come expecting.